everybody loves Queen, right? She's funny, she's stylish, she's just really cool to fight. Her dynamic with her subjects and the Lightners, and Ralsei to an extent, are all really interesting and also mildly bizarre. If someone were to have a completely surface level understanding of the plot, the exchange between Noelle and Queen at the end of the Giga battle would seem completely out of left field. Why would Noelle be talking about living in a world controlled by Queen if she knows it's just a dream? This is where we put our literary analysis goggles on and see that Noelle is actually talking to her overbearing mother through talking to Queen. It's a simple speculative jump that is supported by basically everything else we see in Canon about Noelle's mom. But what does that mean for Queen, exactly? Queen embodies a sort of archetypical mother, ruler and provider and tyrant. She puts herself above others and demands worship. This is basically the villainized and exaggerated idea of a mother figure, someone who both provides but also belittles. Parent-child relationships will always have a power imbalance, but as the child ages, that imbalance should disappear, as the child begins taking control of their life and becomes a functioning adult. Queen overrides this natural progression through her blatantly stating that she's better than adults too. Everything about her character just screams mommy issues personified and I want to explore what that actually means for everyone, not just Noelle. Before diving headfirst into this though, we need to set up some ground rules. For one, Queen's role of mother doesn't extend to Darkners, other than Rossi, but I'll explain that later. We can see that Swatch and the Swatchlings are her servants and butlers, which could still fit the archetype if not for the fact that Swatch seems to imply that a Darkner's worship of Queen carries romantic, possibly even sexual connotations. What with the Swatchlings posing sexily in the background, the atmosphere isn't exactly familial, like it is when she's interacting with Lancer, for example. Lancer is also a bit of a loose screw at first glance. A queen is his actual mother, right? Well, not exactly. Lancer calls her a wild mom when he helps you escape, but once she's recruited, he calls her a girl dad. To me, this seems like a case of Spade King at one point telling Lancer that he doesn't have a mother, which may actually be true. And Queen taking care of Lancer then prompts the boy to call her something other than mom. And with Queen being a machine, I doubt she could actually be Lancer's biological mother, as she doesn't seem to be biological at all. What's more likely is that she's just an old flame of the king and Lancer's biological mother is the ever-elusive Queen of Spades. So what about Ralsei then? He's a darkener, but I very much so believe this theory applies to him too. And before anyone tries to pull the Ralsei as a lightener theory out of their ass crack, or God forbid the Ralsei as Azrael theory, I need to state the following. Ralsei traveling between dark worlds without being physically carried there isn't impossible, even if it's not explained yet. Ralsei has a resemblance to boss monsters, not any single boss monster in particular, even though Susie states otherwise, and he has a fucking colored talk sprite, meaning he's a darkener. I refuse to talk anymore about this topic, go argue about that shit in the comment section of my other theory video. Now, let's delve into my actual theory with an easy one. Noelle. We all picked up on Noelle and Queen's mother-daughter dynamic, right? Overbearing and pressuring mom, trying to make her daughter happy without thinking what she might actually want because the kid never vocally protests. But it kind of goes one step ahead. Queenie specifically seems to stalk Noelle, or attempt to, by making a truce with Chris to find Noelle. She says find, but I really do think she's trying to follow her every move. My reason for this is that Noelle does seem to spend a lot of time in the library's computer lab, and not at home. She must have a computer in her own home, yet she uses the one in the library more. Why is that? I have a sneaking suspicion, Noelle's mom has a history of keeping track of everything Noelle does in the house, including on the computer. Judging by how ready Noelle is to just spend a whole day at Caddy's, I'm guessing it's common for her to avoid being home at all. Her strange and sad searches are the in-game reason why Queenie takes a particular interest in keeping Noelle safe. Those strange and sad searches are most likely her searching her sister's name over and over again. It's implied that Des, short for December probably, is missing, and has been missing for a long time. This would narratively mean that Noelle mom started taking interest in Noelle after Des went missing, and that makes a lot of sense to me. After one of your daughters goes missing, and the incompetent chief of police, who is also your family friend, can't find her, you do everything in your power to make sure the same thing doesn't happen to your other daughter too. In the Snowgrave route, Queen and Susie seem to clash on what Noelle should do after she's been manipulated to murder. Susie says Noelle needs to wake up already, while Queen says she's already too awake. My personal reading of this is that Susie's trying to get Noelle to see what's in front of her, to wake up and confront what happened, while Queen thinks Noelle should just ignore it, go to sleep, stay in blissful ignorance to what happened to her. Yes, Susie's use of wake up already is directly tied to the lie about the dark world that she told Noelle. It doesn't seem to be a lie that worked though. Later in the route, Noelle is seen questioning everything that happened, wondering if it wasn't just a dream. Susie in the Snow Grey route, whether she meant to or not, made Noelle see the dark world as not a dream, more than she did in the normal route. 
Basically, what I'm trying to say is, Noelle's mother wants to keep her asleep. She wants Noelle to stay obedient and good and to hide from who she really is, judging by the robot face jokes, and how Noelle wearing her disguise is the only way she ever manages to get away from Queen. By being what her mother wants her to be, Noelle temporarily gets her off her back. She gets a moment of peace. I'm not the only one who pointed this out, but does Noelle actually want to be on the track team? Does she really want to do all the schoolwork she constantly excels at? Or is she just doing these things because they're what her mother wants her to do? Things that are familiar. Noelle has this insatiable urge to go into the unknown, to see new things, to experience new fears, and it's genuinely admirable, but also tragic when contrasted against how she's restricted and not allowed to step out of what's expected of her. Her mother's maladaptive love of Noelle is perfectly shown through what Queen puts her through. Will Noelle be able to stand up to her mother like she stood up to Queenie? I guess we'll have to wait and see about that. Now let's apply this reading to everyone else. First of all, Susie and Queen first clash when Noelle is kidnapped. This is seemingly a minor thing, as it's just a setup for the rest of the chapter. But it's important to note because Susie doesn't seem to fit in anywhere in hometown. What the fuck does that mean, you may be asking? Well, I'm not the first one to think this. There's a mini theory floating around that Susie actually recently moved into hometown, explaining why she doesn't know who Azriel is, why she doesn't get along with anyone, why everyone keeps wondering about her, like fresh gossip about a new face in town. The only possible thing that could go against this theory is that Susie does know who Toriel is, enough to know that she's Chris's mother. But that can also be explained by Toriel just working at the school. Toriel specifically states that Alphys told her about Susie's behavior, as if Toriel never interacted with Susie herself in a school setting. Again, this lines up with Toriel specifically being a preschool teacher and Susie only recently moving into town. All this to say, Susie and Queen first clash when someone Susie cares about is taken away from her. An easy read being that Susie and her mother's relationship became strained or worsened further when they moved into hometown. It's no surprise that Queen doesn't seem to really understand Susie or talk to her in any meaningful way. An inattentive or neglectful parent is an easy way to make a kid wind up as aggressive and closed off as Susie. Furthermore, I know it's a very tempting read to say that Susie's parents are just flat out abusive, and I'm not saying that that can't be the case. I would just like to argue that her mother, in the very least, is trying to relate to her in some way, but sort of failing. Without saying why Susie cares about shitty skateboard video games in the library, Queen keeps trying to appeal to Susie's emotion through logic and reason, I guess. Susie searches for those games in the library because she's bored and procrastinating, not because she has some vested interest in skateboards specifically. Susie is, as Berkeley puts it, a gamer goal trademark, but she's also so much more than just that, and Queenie fails to see it because she's looking at Susie through a very narrow and misguided window. There's also some important things to note about Toriel. Not only is she the only adult Susie seems to respect in any meaningful way, but when Toriel asks her to call her parents, Susie just doesn't. No idea how to fit that in cleanly with what Queen does, but it's on the table and I feel it needs to be addressed. Maybe Susie just doesn't like her parents, but they're trying to do right by her anyway? We just don't know, and Queen is an interesting window into a potential interpretation. Oh boy, this is a long one. I just realized I have class in like 20 minutes. <laughs> Queen and Chris first clash at the arcade game. This is basically just a fun game they play with Queen for seemingly no reason. But an important thing to note here is that Chris can't play Queen's game without the help of their friends. This is significant because the next time Queen and Chris clash is when Queen decides to make a truce with them. I think that this specific order of events shows that Chris and Toriel could only ever have fun with the rest of the family there too. With those two other members missing, things aren't as easy. Toriel says herself that the house feels lonely with just the two of them, and we can tell from Chris's past actions that they and Toriel didn't always get along. They flush bath bombs down the toilet, they eat all the pie every time she makes it, she keeps her room constantly locked because of them, and the most damning of all, she used to borrow the How to Take Care of Humans book from the library a lot. So much so that it's the only thing Chris can remark about the damn thing. Chris and Toriel are a family, but at best a cooperative one with not much else there. At worst, a genuinely dysfunctional one. Chris is miserable in Toriel's care and she doesn't do anything about it. She remarks upon how she's worried about them, but does nothing to actually help them heal. Much like how Queenie treats Chris, arguably best out of all of the kids, but it's shallow, it's casual, it's not what Chris needs. She actively compliments them on being bland and not opinionated, and it's easy to draw a parallel to Toriel, who seems to not facilitate any of Chris's interests despite them having many, like piano, or a cult, or crafting, or dancing, or literally anything. Toriel actively and unabashedly dismisses everything about Asgore in front of Chris, and constantly talk about all the wonderful things Asriel did, all how great Asriel was, creating this deep rift between Chris and the rest of their family, like what Queen tries to do by equating Chris to herself while dismissing their friends as not understanding them. It's an issue we can see in Toriel too, just more implicitly. 
Let's take a look at the interaction Toriel has with Asgore in the supermarket. Yes, Asgore is shooting a pointless shot and it's really cringe to watch, but I specifically want to focus on the part where he brings up the kids. At first, he brings up Asriel, and Toriel quickly dismisses him with an I'll get back to you on that. And when he tells her to say hi to Chris for him, she dismisses that too. At no point does she actually say hi to Chris for him. Sure, someone might say this is a minor detail, but coupled with how quickly she is to throw away the flowers Chris brought her, we can assume this isn't an isolated incident. That she keeps doing everything in her power to distance herself from Asgore in every way, and that's fine, more power to her, but it's not okay when it's directly affecting her child's relationship with their father. Chris has been successfully isolated from everyone and anyone they could have ever had a bond with, other than Toriel. Whether she means to or not, Toriel created a home for Chris that no longer feels like home. She's isolated them at school too because she keeps doning on them and not letting them just have a normal education experience. It's a known fact that family is highly discouraged from working in the same workplace together because it strains familial relationships. Azrael is Chris's idolized older brother and Toriel facilitated them living in his shadow and when he left, they had no one left other than Toriel. It's shown that Chris is genuinely lonely in the city, without Susie and Ralsei, and Noel being there means nothing to them either. Queenie, whether she meant to or not, isolated Chris from their loved ones for her personal gain. Just like what Toriel did. God, no wonder Chris acts the way they do, when they feel like everyone around them either hates them, abandons them, or tries to use them and control them. I'm not saying Toriel is a bad mother, I just think there's more nuance to her than just good goat mom at all times. She's flawed and you can't have the same approach to raising every single child. Her method may be good for Azrael and very young kids, but it's clear that Chris is unhappy while in her care for one reason or another. I think it's also really important to mention the alcohol connection. Yes, yes, funny haha -ha battery acid joke, but let's actually examine what this is. Queenie is near constantly in the chapter drinking what is heavily implied to be alcohol to her. However, there are only two places where she's shown to be drunk. Her talking to Chris in the alley and her almost final battle. This is significant because both are directly tied to Chris, especially during the battle where Chris makes an overly emotional toast to Queenie, which is again played for laughs. In the Undertale Winter Clock dialogue, we can see that Toriel has a bit of a drinking issue. She's not an alcoholic, but she's also not responsible with her drinking either. Papyrus equates this to her having too much eggnog, which is just Toby winking at us and saying Toriel got shitfaced. Flowey ends up being the one to take care of Toriel in these moments, bringing her water, basically making sure she's okay, which sort of shows that Toriel, whether she means to or not, makes her kids responsible for her well-being when she drinks. Obviously, Undertale and Deltarune are not the same, but I think something like this, a nasty habit that a character has, can easily be carried over from one game to another. Now that emotional toast Chris made to Queenie doesn't feel so funny, does it? I need to preface this entire section with, I do not like Birdly. He's annoying and obnoxious and every moment he's on screen I'm either yelling at him or groaning. However, I feel he's an important pin to this theory so I will give him the time of day this once. Birdly is this overcompensating mess of a child who seeks to impress at every opportunity. He prides himself in being better than everyone else but as we all know, pride is often just a code for people who have zero self-esteem. And throughout the chapter we see him trying to overcompensate the most with Queenie, trying to impress her and constantly bothering her while she ignores him. I feel it's an important distinction to make between ignore and forget. I'll bring up the forget half of it with Rossi, but the thing you need to know for Birdly is that Queenie has active malintent with her mistreatment of Birdly. The roller coaster fight with Birdly is a particularly important showcase of this, where literally all the flavor text shows Birdly trying to reach out to Queenie like a mother figure and her ignoring him and neglecting him in every way she can. It's funny flavor text, yes, but also a tragic portrayal of what Birdly has to deal with at home. The fact that when he first won a spelling bee, he felt overwhelmed by affection and praise taught him that he needs to earn his love. No well-adjusted child with loving parents act that way to praise from a spelling bee. He feels he needs to earn their attention and care, and because he relies so heavily on Noelle for that which earns him that recognition, he feels that he's lesser than her, lesser than everyone else. All that bullshit about a smart utopia, it's Birdly desperately clinging to the one part of his identity that Queenie seems to be even mildly amused by. Then he runs it into the ground and she's back to hating him. In her own words, there's nothing wrong with Birdly, he's just really annoying. Um, Mrs. Birdly's mom, can we talk? All this culminates into Birdly being controlled by Queenie by the end of the chapter, which seems to be a rehashing of a similar theme as Noelle, but just from a different angle. With Noelle, we have the perspective of the person being controlled. With Birdly, we have the perspective of the people witnessing somebody being controlled. Literally, the only way to save Birdly in the fight is to show him mercy, to not give him the attention when he's doing shit to impress people. The most tragic part of this is that Birdly and Noelle seem to have similar family situations, except Birdly's parents were never that supportive, while Noelle's family suffered tragedy and could never fully recover. Does this town have a therapist? 
lastly, let's talk of the person who arguably this theory might not even apply to. As stated before, I kind of dismissed the archetype reading of Queenie when applied to other Darkners, with good reason, but Rossi seems to be an exempt from this rule, as he is with a lot of Darkner rules. He doesn't turn to stone, he travels where he wants to, he's all alone in Castletown, and most of this is probably because his origin is from the Grand Dark Fountain. It's made of pure darkness, right, as opposed to those other dark fountains, which are made of 50% darkness, 50% polyester, and it probably grants Rossi powers and knowledge that other darkness just don't have. This explanation doesn't jive with this theory though, as this is an analysis of the text, not the lore. I think Rossi being often lumped in with the Lightners is just a meta consequence of him being no one without them. He deliberately and constantly allies himself with the heroes of the prophecy, without question, and through doing that, the narrative treats him the same way it does the Lightners. This again doesn't actually make him a Lightner, it just makes him a main character, which he is. The spotlight is on him, just as it is the Lightners, and the Dark World serve to explore the Lightners in a little bit more depth. Therefore, it works the same way with Rossi, too. All this to say Rossi's parents are awful. Rossi is very clearly forgotten and neglected by Queenie, which checks out seeing as he lives alone in Castletown, where his parents may be off to Vegas, who the fuck knows, but they left this poor kid to fend for himself with the idea of a world-ending prophecy looming over him at every moment. Great parenting, guys, you somehow managed to be worse than Lancer's dad. Queenie forgets Rossi is there at all, which is very different kind of neglect to what Birdly is dealing with. She has nowhere to put him and she turns him into a her butler instead, which seems like a clear metaphor for a child who's neglected and whose parents don't put in the effort to raise him, so he has to learn to raise himself. It also ties in with Rossi's fucked up ideas of identity and kindness. Only after spending a long time with Susie does he realize the nuances of being kind and what being yourself looks like, and it leaves him unsure of who he really is. Again, not a thing that happens with children who have healthy relationships with their parents. Identity crises when you're a teenager are normal, but Rossi is actively walking the line between I choose to be a nobody and I have no idea how social interaction works with anyone, please, for the love of God, help me. Queenie doesn't go out of her way to talk to Rossi like she does Noelle, Chris, and even Susie to an extent. She doesn't even particularly dislike Rossi, she just doesn't even look at him. He has no place in this world without her being opposed on him by his friends somehow. He's quick to please while staying on the sidelines, trying not to be a burden because that's what he was, intentionally or not, taught by his upbringing. Does Castletown have any therapists, perchance? Holy shit, I'm actually gonna finish this recording before class, okay? I went the most in-depth with Chris, because I feel there's a lot to unpack and not enough people are talking about it. Seeing as Toriel might be directly involved in the next chapter, I would hope this gets addressed there, but the narrative at no point seems to frame Toriel as at fault in any way, so I wouldn't be holding my breath. Especially seeing how wholesome Toriel and Susie's interaction is, I'm afraid there might be no closure on this topic and story. On the other hand, it's tempting to draw a similar conclusion to King's role in the story as we did with Queen. If Queen is the universal mother, then King is the universal father, right? Well, no. Not at all. Not even a little bit. King seems to be narratively representing the whole of Dr. Kind, not just the few individuals you say no matter the route. He acts as your moral compass and that doesn't really jive with any of the interactions we see between the kids and their dads. Specifically, of course, Rudy and Asgore, since those are the only dads we actually talk to other than Spade. There's also a lot to unpack with the roles in the story the other characters have, too. Like Jevil and Spampton, who are foils to Chris in their internal conflict that have to be actively sought out and dealt with in order for Chris to be able to get the Shadow Crystals, which themselves seem to be tied to the idea of an evil mirror in fairy tales. But, like, that's a huge can of worms and I don't have the time to unpack right now. I might write out my other theories about Daltrone, and if I do, you'll find them on my AO3 account, and I'll leave that in the description. If you like my content and my drawings, I highly recommend you read my fan comic Dreadnought. It's basically the only regularly released content I've ever made, so if you like what I do, I think you'll like that too. Or if you just like my drawings, you can follow my art tumblr where I post once every blue moon. It's not much, but it's honest work. And remember, this is all just theories. It's okay to disagree, especially when it's a highly specific reading of the story like this one. Maybe Queenie is the metatextual universal mother of all Lightners and Rossi, or maybe she's just a cool cyborg lady. Who knows? Point being, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. See you in like 10,000 years when I release my next video, which won't even be a theory video. I can't believe I actually managed to record all that between my classes. I am an actual fucking god.